For those of you just joining us, uh, we're just giving a few seconds for the participants to fill the room. So that will explain the silence right now. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Alexander Meliagru Hitchens. I'm the research director at the program on extremism at GWU. I'm also a senior lecturer at King's College London. Um, our event today, anti-Semitism uh, in Western extremist movements responding to the threat, um, is gonna look at a few things, both related to how anti-Semitism continues to be a key interest and, and motivation for a variety of extremist movements and, and lone actor terrorists. Um, and I'm joined today uh, by uh, Samantha Vinograd. She's the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention, the Department for Homeland Security. Uh, Mitch Silber, the Executive Director uh, of the uh, Community Security Initiative and Dave Rich, the executive director of the Community Security Trust in the UK. Um, and we're gonna sort of have a, a more open discussion rather than sort of presentations from the panelists. I'm gonna open up with a, with a question of my own for the panelists to tackle. And I may have a couple of follow-up questions before the audience. Again, thanks for joining us. You'll see at the bottom of your Zoom uh, panel, a QA and a option. Uh, we very much want you to send your questions in even starting now. Um, and certainly while everyone's speaking, uh, you can enter your questions in the Q&A and I will be looking at them. And uh, once we end our initial back and forth, um, I'll start reading out some of the audience questions. So feel free to start populating those, uh, populating that uh, window with questions now. Um, pretty timely event, uh, just recently, Omar al in the United States was arrested and charged for plotting an attack on a um, synagogue in the United States. Um, also happened to praise Dylan Roof. So again, a sort of uh, some things to speak about in terms of the crossovers here between uh, jihadist and extreme right interests in uh, pretty anti-Semitism. But my kind of overarching question, we'll start with uh, Mitch as a, a, a respondent, um, is kind of, if you want to, from your perspective, tell me why, how and why uh, does anti-Semitism continue to animate violent extremists uh, of all types uh, and all stripes in the West. Uh, go ahead, Mitch. Great, thanks so much, Alexander. Thank you for GW for putting this together and to my uh, to my colleagues on the panel. So, you know, I'll put on my intelligence analyst hat and think about this question, how and why is anti-Semitism um, mobilizing extremists to action? And I think you have to look at anti-Semitism as the virus um, with many variants. Right, and each variant presents with slightly different surface proteins, but inside it carries the same DNA. So in looking at these four different categories, you know, you could break it up into number one, white supremacist, Nazi race war, anti-Semitism, right? This variant mobilizes extremists because it suggests there's an apocalyptic struggle between the white race and the Jews, and in the United States, the fear is of the quote unquote browning of America, in which, as we heard at Charlottesville, Jews will replace us and replace us with who? People like those hyped up in the Central American caravans from 2018. Um, and this is what led the terrorist in Pittsburgh to attack the Tree of Life synagogue, killing 11 worshipers. His fear about this race war that was about to happen and that he had an obligation to do something to save his race. So that's number one, that variant. The second variant is the Islamist. And that one really melds sort of a, a Quranic view of Jews wedded with European anti-Semitic ideas uh, to create this sort of trans-historical symbol of evil. From Syed Qutb to bin Laden Zawahiri, the Jews have always featured prominently as cosmic enemies, part of a Zionist crusader alliance. And while we haven't seen any deadly attacks in the US from this worldview, as Alexander cited, this was what potentially was motivating this New Jersey teenager last week who was arrested for threatening synagogues. But in Europe, we have seen this turn to deadly effect in Toulouse, at the Brussels Jewish Museum, at the Copenhagen Synagogue, and at the hyper Deli in Paris. So that's the second variant. The third variant mobilizing extremist action is Black Hebrew Israelite. 
this is what we're talking about when we're talking about Kyrie Irving's film, Hebrews to Negroes. The Jews aren't really the heirs to the Israelites. Instead, they've stolen the birthright from Africans, like Jacob stole the birthright from Esau, and as a result, violence is legitimate. This, this mobilized two individuals in Jersey City in December of 2019 to kill three people at a kosher supermarket and one police officer. And finally, the last variant is the anti-Zionist, anti-Semitism. And this variant suggests that the state of Israel is illegitimate, having stolen the land from the Palestinians, and that it mobilizes extremist action when Israel goes to war. For example, in May of 2021, when Israel and Hamas went to war, there were spontaneous acts of violence directed at Jews in New York and Los Angeles because those Jews were stand-ins for Israel. It was a proxy for striking Israel. And though they weren't deadly, there were some particularly brutal beatdowns. For example, of a young man whose only sin was to emerge from the subway station at 47th Street and 6th Avenue wearing a kippah and being a visible Jew. So those are the different variants of anti-Semitism. Um, that's the how. The why is probably a more difficult question. I would say that there are a number of different stresses on society that are particularly acute today. Political, we were all holding our breath last Tuesday for the elections. Demographic, the United States is changing. We're going to be a minority majority country soon, and there are elements of American society that haven't made their peace with that. Economic, legacy of COVID as well as 2008, and then a shock to the system. There was this dystopian killer virus that defied explanation. And when you have one of these phenomena, what can you explain this by? Well, you've got to go to a conspiracy, a conspiracy theory. The Jews created the virus. The Jews profited from the virus. The Jews are the virus. So a few different thoughts on what's mobilizing people and, and why. Thanks very much, Mitch. A couple of very interesting points to pick up on that I will do uh, later. But yes, interesting that you noted about the kind of, about these four variants, I think is a very good way to present that and categorize it. Um, and interesting to know, yes, the kind of Islamist anti-Semitism um, really being influenced a lot and often ignored how much really it's it's the European anti-Semitism that has influenced how jihadists view Jews. You know, for example, um, while yes, they're influenced by that uh, kind of fundamentalist or literal interpretation of the Quran, there's nothing in the Quran that says Jews run the world, right? That that claim um, was a kind of a European racist claim that uh, has trickled down into the Arab world, particularly into jihadism. Um, thanks, but thanks for, I have a few other follow-up questions, but go ahead, uh, Dave. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone from London. Good morning to you, and thanks for having me on. Um, I think in answer to your original question, Alex, about why anti-Semitism continues to animate so many extremist movements, I think the, the, the simple answer is because it always has done. And anti-Semitism is a system of thought and a way of viewing the world that is very good at self-sustaining and self-replicating in different societies and in different social and political and religious context and this is why it plays across so many different extremist movements and extremist ideologies as Mitch has outlined um, and the core that drives this is the overlap between anti-semitism and conspiracy theories and when I say this I would differentiate between what you might consider anti-Jewish prejudice of, of, of a, the nature of a bigotry and a kind of fully formed way of viewing the world that places Jews as the central actor that pulls everyone's strings and makes everything happen. And this is something that is common to, to extremist movements across the board. Uh, there's a British think tank, Demos, that did a survey of the, the discourse and literature of over 50 extremist movements from a range of political and religious backgrounds and found the single most common conspiracy theory across all their literature was uh, variants on the idea of, of, of Zog, the Zionist occupation government, that Jews control governments, control politicians and the media and so on. And this was uh, uh, particularly with far right groups, but not exclusively to them. It was across the board. Now, this piece of research was done over a decade ago. 
And what we've seen since then is really a, a supercharging in the popularity of conspiracy theories across the board. And there are various uh, global events that have facilitated this. The pandemic is an obvious one. Um, but there have been others, too, in terms of economic crashes and wars and waves of terrorism and so on. And there is a brand new mechanism to help spread these conspiracy theories, which is the, the, the ubiquity of social media in people's lives. And there is absolutely no doubt that one reason why we're seeing surges in anti-Semitism from different types of extremism um, is because it has such a powerful uh, vehicle to spread now and to spread globally. So we see all these um, far-right terrorist attacks, for example, that we've seen in Pittsburgh, in San Diego, in Halle, in Christchurch, most recently in, in Buffalo and in uh, Bratislava um, and in other places as well, targeting all, all different minorities. And each one is by a lone actor, but none of them are really acting on their own. What they are doing is acting as uh, on behalf of and as part of a genuinely global networked subculture of violent anti-Semitic far-right extremism. And each one, as they act, inspires the next copycat, which may come weeks or even months later, but you can trace them from really from Brenton Tarrant onwards. And each manifesto literally plagiarizes the previous ones. And what's in terms of anti-Semitism, what is most alarming in a way is that even when uh, the, the people we're talking about target other minorities, they almost have to explain it in anti-Semitic terms. So Peyton Gendron, after, uh, in his manifesto before the Buffalo attack, had a whole section excusing himself for not attacking Jews and explaining what, almost an apologetics for why he hadn't attacked Jews. Um, Juraj Kradchik in Bratislava in his manifesto um, basically made the argument that even though he'd killed two, two men outside a, a bar used by the LGBT plus community, his argument was that community is basically a manifestation of the Jewish system because everything is part of the Jewish system. So it's as if he attacked Jews. So this anti-Semitism is it's the dynamism that pushes and propels this extremist violence forward, not just I mean, the examples I've used are from the far right, but not just from the far right. And so I think this, this puts us in quite a new situation now compared to where we were even just a few years ago. Yeah, that's interesting to consider the, something new here. Um, uh, and I wonder, and I'll, I'll perhaps get you to um, expound on this after Samantha, but um, I wonder if we can go even further back than Tarrant to, to Brevik um, as, as, as a motivator or if Tarrant did something different, And uh, but it might be worth thinking about that. Um, but thanks, Dave. Uh, go ahead, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to what is unfortunately an incredibly timely conversation about the rise of anti-Semitism in America. Before I dive into some professional thoughts, I'll just say on a personal level, the fatal impacts, the fatal and violent impacts of anti-Semitism have been something that I've understood for as long as I can remember. My father is a 93-year-old French Holocaust survivor who taught me from the earliest age what happens when hateful anti-Semitic rhetoric goes in unchecked and has taught me about the nexus to violence associated with such rhetoric. And we've seen that play out, not just in the Holocaust, but in a series of violent incidents throughout history. Uh, my father taught me about what happens when people with influence spread conspiracy theories and tropes and taught me that the words of leaders matter and the actions of everyday citizens as well to counter uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric, um, how much that matters because of the nexus to violence. And that's really motivated a lot of the work that I've done in public service, including here at the Department of Homeland Security. We here at DHS share um, the analysis that uh, expressed by my fellow co-panelists about this, the ongoing spate of anti-Semitic attacks in this country. And our Office of Intelligence and Analysis assesses that anti-Semitism remains a significant driver of domestic violent extremism. 
I was listening last week to FBI Director Ray, who shared at the ADL Never Is Now conference that a full 63% of religious hate crimes are motivated by anti-Semitism, targeting a group, the Jewish people, that make up just 2.4% of our population. The ADL has tracked many of these anti-Semitic incidents, and these incidents were reported in all 50 states as well as the District of Columbia. We continue to assess that the threat of racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, of which anti-Semitic attacks are a significant contributor, remains incredibly virulent uh, across the country. The intelligence community assesses that racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists who, motiv who advocate for the superiority of the white race, as well as militia violent extremists, uh, present the most lethal DVE threat in the homeland. In many cases, domestic violent extremist actors have spent inordinate amounts of time online viewing extremist violent materials. We've mentioned a, a few of the perpetrators of that and engaging with like-minded individuals. That is why here at the department, as we continue to work with all of our partners to understand the landscape from an intelligence perspective, we are very focused on working with our partners from an operational perspective and a policy perspective to engage at the earliest possible stage when there is um, a nexus to violence. And what we're seeing across the country is that working with partners on the ground trying to get help to people at the earliest possible stage, whether it's through the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships or DHS or otherwise, to try to curb this violence as soon as an individual is showing indications, whether online or in physical manif manifestations, showing indications that they may be going down the path to violence is critical because the time from which an individual expresses aspirational uh, rhetoric to the time that an individual is acting on that rhetoric has shortened significantly in the digital age and for other reasons which we can go into, Alexander. And that's why we, along with the intelligence and analysis piece, are incredibly focused on our partnerships in the space. And we here at DHS are very lucky to partner with um, entities and individuals in the Jewish community, but also across the country. Addressing anti-Semitism and curbing anti-Semitic fueled violence is going to require each and every person in this country engaging and acting to stop anti-Semitism as soon as they experience. And that's something we can talk more about. Thanks very much, Samantha, and also for sharing a personal, your own personal connection to this. Um, I'll just follow up with a question for each of you based on your own discussions. I, I think that uh, Mitch, uh, you talked about the four variants, the fourth one being the sort of uh, anti-Zionist anti-Semitism. And I think that's the one that I think perhaps is for, for many people who don't look at this all the time, is the hardest one to parse out. I mean, and I wonder if you if you could perhaps help the audience and, and, and also explain from your perspective, when does the criticism of Israel, criticism of, of even the idea of or the concept of Zionism, when does that bleed into anti-Semitism? And when is it uh, a kind of more legitimate critique? You know, how do you, how does one parse that out or, or identify the difference? Well, you know, I think when we're talking about a debate over particular policies of the state of Israel, that's certainly fair game as the discussion of the policies of any ally or partner of the United States, you know, gets discussed, whether it's France, the UK, Germany, Japan, or Israel. You know, when we start to talk about the legitimacy of the existence of the state of Israel. Now, now we've crossed the line. And, you know, there were a lot of people who said, well, you know, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, they're really very different. And I think the veneer, even my hesitation to link the two directly was ripped away uh, last spring. Because when you see a young group of men attacking visible Jews outside of a synagogue, when Israel and Gaza are at war, they're attacking them because they're Jews, they're visible Jews, not because no one checked, are you Likud, are you labor, are you a Zionist? No, there is not, that wasn't happening. So by virtue of being a Jew, you were a stand-in for a Zionist. And by the way, we saw this phenomenon, I'm sure Dave can talk about this, in France in 2014. 
when Israel and, and Hamas went to war, violence erupted on Parisian streets against French Jews. So same phenomena in Europe, making its way to the US uh, seven years later in New York, in LA. And that's why I, I would make, you know, the, uh, that's why my, my analysis says that really, you know, in many ways, these two have merged and anti-Zionism is just a veneer for a new form of anti-Semitism. Yes, and I mean, the very fact that anti-Semitic attacks tend to, in the West, tend to um, increase in the wake or during uh, conflicts escalating uh, between Israelis and Palestinians uh, probably tells us that right there. And of course, the UK had a couple of very disturbing incidences as well like that. Um, and that's a useful, I think, way of, of helping people distinguish between these two. Um, Dave, we talked, and I think you've written about this before, and we've talked about the, and Mitch talked about the overlap between jihadi and, and white supremacist anti-Semitism. Um, how do we deal with the, uh, with kind of left-wing anti-Semitism? I know you've talked about this and the UK has had its, its own experiences with that in mainstream politics. Um, how can we, how can we understand left-wing anti-Semitism when we often consider the left, even, even left-wing extremists, um, as, as not really being defined by kind of supremacy or, or bigotry. How does, how does anti-Semitism work, um, as it were, uh, from, from the perspective of someone who's, who's left wing? So I think it works in different ways. Um, one way, very obvious way, is that left wing anti-Semitism anti tends to be a lot less violent than the more extreme ends of, of far right anti-Semitism or, or jihadist anti-Semitism. But left-wing anti-Semitism tends to key into some very old, very well-known stereotypes about Jews. So some of the most common uh, anti-Semitic stereotypes are around Jews being inordinately powerful or wealthy or controlling and using, using that wealth to, to manipulate politicians and manipulate society, really. And these ideas really developed um, in the 19th century at around the same time that left-wing thought in general, Marxism and socialism and communism and these ideologies were also developing. And what happened was these new left-wing ideologies developed an anti-Semitic variant of their own, that it wasn't just capital that people should oppose, but it, it, it was Jewish capital. It wasn't just exploitation, it was Jewish exploitation. Now, this was always a, a kind of minority tradition within the left. And the left has mostly always opposed anti-Semitism, but it was nevertheless there from the start. And you can go right back to reading, you know, even, even Marx and Bauer, and you can go through all the old uh, so socialist uh, ideologues and writers from that period. And this was at a time where conspiracy theories, which I come back to again, were becoming more and more popular. And really from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century in Europe, almost every conspiracy theory was about Jews, especially ones that were about money and political manipulation and so on. And these theories about the Rothschilds and you have the protocols, the elders of Zion and so on. So this body of ideas, this body of thinking is just there. And there have always been people on the left at different times who've dipped into it, at times encouraged by certain states and governments. I mean, the Soviet Union and its satellites in Eastern Europe were vigorous and enthusiastic purveyors of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories couched in the language of anti-Zionism for decades uh, in between the Second World War and the collapse of the Soviet bloc. And then what you sometimes get is these ideas kind of filtering into mainstream politics and certainly what we had in, in the UK for a few years um, from sort of 2015 to 2019 when the the Labour Party was sort of shifted much to a much more extreme position on the left. These ideas suddenly found a more kind of welcome and accommodating home in mainstream politics that normally they don't. I'm glad to say we've moved on from that period somewhat. Uh, but it was just a reminder that, that anti-Semitism is not some kind of alien feature. It's not, it's not a bug that just appears out of nowhere. These are ideas that have been around for a very long time and that are rooted in some very authentic and mainstream ways of thinking. And when circumstances allow and the context encourages it, you will get people voicing these ideas and other people hearing them and being taken in by them, whatever their political background. 
Yes, I think that's a good way of, of understanding the you know the different it's a slightly different form um, of anti-Semitism from the left, um, but rooted in some similar things. And I, just to follow up as well, you mentioned um, talked a bit about conspiracy theories, and sometimes you hear I've, I think I've heard you discuss this before. Uh, people claim anti-Semitism is itself a conspiracy theory, um, uh, but I don't think that's I think you don't quite agree with that, right? It's a bit more nuanced than that. Um, just generally, uh, you did discuss it a bit, but if you expanded a bit on just this idea of, you know, what is the relationship, I suppose, between a conspiracy theory and, and, and anti-Semitism? Um, and, and yes, do you, what do you think of the claim that anti-Semitism is itself a conspiracy theory? Is that too reductive? No, I think in its purest form, that's correct. But, and I think we have to differentiate between the kind of anti-Jewish prejudice, which, which plays out like a, a kind of common street level bigotry and uh, anti-Semitism as a way of explaining the world. And when you reach that level, that kind of pure form of anti-Semitism, yes, it works very much as a conspiracy theory. And some of the most influential conspiracy theories in history have been about Jews. And you can go back to medieval times and Jews were always accused of conspiring together to harm the rest of society and harm humanity and so on. So it's always been there and it has these components of, of a, a kind of secret elite that is that it appears in lots of places where you might not expect them or might not spot them and maybe disguised in different ways, but pulling everyone's strings and having sort of secret nefarious malevolent power always used to harm others never for anything positive and that really is what what animates anti-semitism and drives it forward and it has a lot in common with conspiracy theories yes and sorry to uh, hold you one more time you mentioned it you know it goes right back to medieval times and yes that jews have been targeted really for so long um what i mean it's a very wide you know sort of wide-ranging question i appreciate but why is it that we keep, you know, that they have been targeted in this way for such a long time, and particularly in, in, in Europe? Um, what is it that, that has um, kind of brought this on? How, you know, what, what is the reason for this kind of really consistent hundreds of years uh, interest in, in, in the threat Jews pose? I mean, this is the million dollar question. Yeah. Um, um, and you can go all the way back to the uh, kind of narrative that was developed in the Gospels, blaming the Jews for, for the crucifixion and so on. And then the way that was deployed in medieval times, especially during the period of the Crusades in Europe, to kind of paint Jews as this de demonic figure at a time where European society was pretty homogenous and Jews were kind of the obvious other within those societies. Um, and these ideas, they kind of embed and they work and they're popular because anti-Semitism has a purpose. It has it, it has it has a benefit and it's a very powerful tool for political leaders, demagogues uh, and uh, and political movements that deploy it and deploy it not just to harm Jews, but but also to to harm others as well, whether that's to withhold rights from others or to paint other people in a certain way. Um, and. There are so many, uh, so many leaders and regimes and movements and so on that have used it to powerful and very damaging effect. That that then encourages others to do the same. And once this has been going on over generations, it's just kind of there, it's set. And the, the, the question becomes not why does it keep coming back, but how do we prevent it from coming back? Because otherwise it, it will just keep repeating. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Samantha, you mentioned something that I wanted to just uh, um, tease out a bit more, which is, uh, and this is something that has been talked about a lot, but I'm interested from the DHS perspective. Um, you mentioned that this the kind of gap between adopting the ideas or come across the ideas, the uh, yeah, ideology or particular anti-Semitism, and then acting on it violently, that it's, it's gone very, it's kind of shortened, right? People can go from exposure to this to action very, you know, and increasingly quickly. Um, now, we talked about, of course, the role social media has on that. Uh, from the DHS perspective, are there, why else do you, are there other reasons that you, that analysts have, have noticed for, for explaining uh, why that gap between idea and, and action has appeared to have 
shortened or gotten smaller. So a, a couple of points, and I just want to revert back to some of the questions you asked my co-panelists. You know, when DHS seeks to pre prevent terrorism and targeted violence, including anti-Semitism, we are ideologically agnostic. What I mean by that is whether it's characterized as, you know, one type of anti-Semitism motivated violence or another across a across a political spectrum or anti-Semitism spectrum, what DHS gets involved when there's a nexus to violence, again, regardless of that very specific um, ideological flavor, if you will. We are also seeing, and I'm curious if my co-panelists are seeing this as well, oftentimes a commingling of ideologies, a commingling of hateful motivations for an incident, and a commingling of contributing factors um, by individuals that have perpetuated these kinds of attacks. Now, in terms of the um, time period under which an individual gets radicalized and then actually commits an act to violence, I think my co-panelists have mentioned a few prime examples in which and you mentioned some as well, Alexander, the accessibility to content that in many cases is a, an inspirational factor for these attacks is quite present. Um, it is easier today to experience and to start to digest the kinds of conspiracy theories, the kinds of tropes, um, candidly, the kinds of um, tactics and techniques that were just historically speaking, slightly less accessible. So I think that that is certainly a factor. And that is why addressing anti-Semitic incidents, addressing this kind of violence requires us thinking much more strategically about prevention. Prevention certainly requires a law enforcement response when an individual may be about to commit an act of violence. And we work extremely heavily with our law enforcement colleagues for that. Um, you know, state, local, tribal, territorial, and other federal partners on the law enforcement side are hugely important from a prevention standpoint, along with our intelligence counterparts and fusion centers literally across the country. But again, because individuals are able to access this kind of information quite readily um, and to experience tactics and techniques and start to plot based upon access to that kind of information. This also just requires a lot more vigilance from community members and non-law enforcement and intelligence partners. And that's why through our Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, we work with stakeholders across the country on that latter piece, Alexander, which is um, you know, if an individual in your community starts showing indications that they may be going down a path to violence, ask for help. <laughs> ask for help from, um, from a faith leader or a school resource officer or a trained social service or mental health professional. And we here at the department are working through what we call CP3, the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, to train as many people as possible on what those indicators may be and how to ask for help. What we don't want is for people to wait until the very last minute before an individual is about to commit an act of violence to call 911 or raise the red flag. After so many of these incidents, we hear after the fact that in a, people around a subject or a suspect knew they were exhibiting concerning behavior, but didn't ask for help for a variety of reasons. If we are gonna get ahead of this, we need to engage in early stage prevention and we need to continue to educate the public. And this is a whole of government issue that I've had the opportunity to discuss with colleagues across the federal government, as well as external stakeholders. We need to continue to educate the public about the violent ramifications of anti-Semitism. Um, anti-Semitism cannot continue to become normalized in this country or around the world. And we need to continue to spread awareness about that specific nexus to violence. And we're literally experiencing it in real time. New Jersey last week was just the latest example, but we cannot allow this anti-Semitism to become normalized or this violence to become normalized. I do not want my daughter to grow up thinking that attacks on synagogues and attacks on Jews 
not to mention any other individual or faith-based entity, are just a normal part of everyday life. And that's why all of us collectively need to continue to point out how abhorrent and dangerous and unacceptable these attacks are. And that's something at DHS that we're focused on, as well as um, working with stakeholders across the country. Thanks. Um, that's very useful. And you talked a bit about kind of prevention work, the CVE work, uh, and the DHS involvement in that and the CP3. Um, and I know that this type of uh, work is, is kind of still in its early phases uh, in the US and you know, other countries in Europe have a bit more developed programs like Prevent in the United Kingdom who have a kind of uh, direct uh, intervention program based on referrals uh, from the community. Um, what might this, I wonder if there's any more detail you can give us on, does, does the US government in any capacity undertake or involve itself directly in prevention work and intervention work? Um, or does it look to empower or back up local community groups that do this themselves? And if it does do that, how does it do that? Or just just any kind of more detail on what sure. prevention specifically looks like. And I'll just mention you flagged the UK program, UK Prevent. I spend um, a lot of time with my UK counterpart sharing promising practices about what the UK is doing, what the US is doing under CP3. And that's a conversation that my team at CP3, as well as myself, as well as the secretary, has with colleagues around the world. So we have certainly countries like the UK um, that have prevention programs. We also have countries that recognize that they have more work to do from a prevention standpoint. And that's why we're building bilateral exchanges with these countries to talk about how, how to build these kinds of programs. And then there are countries who have not, and states as well here in the US that have not suffered an attack yet, that we continue to say waiting until there's a horrific attack is not necessarily the track that we'd advise because the, thre the, the threat of violent extremism, including anti-Semitism is omnipresent. And we want to engage in prevention and build the architecture to prevent acts of targeted violence and terrorism at the earliest possible stage. Now, CP3, the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, takes an approach that seeks to build a culture of prevention in this country. And what I mean by that is, in this country, we have cultures of prevention around suicide, around drug use, around domestic violence, around forest fires, and I could continue. We need to build that same kind of culture around preventing acts of targeted violence and terrorism. That is a whole of society endeavor. That is not a DHS or federal government specific exercise. So what we are seeking to do is educate through training, through outreach, through our regional field staff, educate uh, all stakeholders, whether it be trained professionals or members of the public, on what indications that an individual may be going down a path to violence may look like, how to ask for help, and then three, to build confidence in asking help. Again, too often people think, well, you know, I only can call 911, and if I do that, my loved one's going to get, you know, thrown into jail, when in fact, calling a trained mental health practitioner or social service uh, worker and saying, I'm concerned about my loved one, um, what do you recommend, can help avert tragedy. So we're seeking to do those three things. And finally, in terms of DHS directly engaging, DHS cannot be, nor should we be in every community. Our goal is to equip and empower stakeholders at a very local level to build very localized prevention networks. So I travel around the country engaging communities and talking to that whole ecosystem of folks that may be involved in prevention and then engage my team to offer training, financial resources, technical assistance, and more. We're also working with states to develop state level prevention strategies. And this pertains to addressing targeted violence and terrorism in all of its forms. Again, unfortunately, anti-Semitic fueled violence, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism more generally is a huge part of that. So CP3 is focused on prevention around the country. And um, I think that we're scaling um, our efforts in light of the threat environment. And we're hoping to work with as many stakeholders as possible to help address this, this uh, incredibly dangerous and virulent threat stream. 
Thank you for that. It's very uh, informative. Um, there's a few questions coming from the audience now, but I've just had a, one more from me. Uh, and this relates kind of directly to the work that both the CST and CSI do. Uh, and I'll start with, with Mitch. Um, in terms of just actual practical kind of safeguarding um, of synagogues and other, other Jewish centers, Jewish communities, what, what kind of things are done um, to protect synagogues, um, that physical security, and how has this, if at all, changed the kind of experience of, of Jewish life, uh, if at all, Mitch? Sure, it's a great question. And, you know, Alexander, we know each other long enough from when I was at NYPD as Director of Intelligence Analysis. And during my time there, I never thought that the New York Jewish community needed a special security umbrella to protect itself. Um, but that was, you know, years ago. Um, you know, since we've had Tree of Life and we've had Poway and we've had Munzee and we've had, um, you know, Colleyville, um, you know, the dynamics have changed on the ground. You know, Kanye said DEFCON 3, but, you know, Kanye was wrong for a lot of reasons. The feeling on the ground is that we're at DEFCON 1, which is a much more dangerous stage. And, you know, all of, all of the dashboard is, is blinking red. We really are very concerned. So what we did in New York is the U UJA Federation and the JCRC of New York created from scratch a security program based on Dave's organization, the CST, in New York to protect a population of 1.6 million people and about 2,400 institutions. So we now have a team of a dozen people, six of them regional security managers, looking at the physical security for every Jewish school, synagogue, camp, museum, community center, visiting them, doing analysis, helping them apply for a DHS grant, which is one of the ways the DHS is most helpful on the ground is through, through these FEMA grants that can actually uh, em, you know, improve the security, physical security of a location. We have two intelligence analysts. They're in the deep and the dark web um, looking for threats coming from Gab and 4chan and 8chan, things that we know the FBI is looking for, but we're looking for it specifically coming toward New York, coming toward our institutions, coming toward our population. And when we find those people who are, are threatening to do something, who seemingly have weapons, who have indicated their motivation um, and their capacity to do something, we're sharing that in real time with the FBI, with NYPD, with the JTTF. Um, and it's a, it's a very robust dialogue between local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, and our organization on a regular basis. Um, and you know, in New York, we've got this program, but there are similar programs in Los Angeles, in Ohio, in Boston, in Miami, not scaled up to the New York numbers, just because you know, New York happens to have the largest Jewish diaspora population outside the state of Israel, but we're sharing with them as well. We're working hand in hand with the Anti-Defamation League and their center on extremism. Um, when appropriate, we're even sharing with foreign partners um, like CST and others. So it's a pretty robust program. It didn't exist in December of 2019. So we're approaching a three year anniversary and I couldn't imagine New York or any other part of the country operating without it because it fills a gap in between the community and in between local government and law enforcement. That's really uh, useful to hear and you know, very impressive. You've done that so quickly. I'm sure you're very, very proud of um, uh, the record of the CSI so far. And Dave, I was going to go to you uh, just, just before that. Um, Samantha, I see you got to put your hand up. I wanted just to wanted to piggyback, thank you, on something Mitch said, um, which I was going to touch on later, which is just the physical security aspect of this. Here at the department, we recognize that prevention is a core factor when it comes to addressing um, violent incidents fueled by anti-Semitism. At the same time, we have a range of financial resources available to help uh, improve physical security through the FEMA grants that Mitch mentioned, and we're happy to share information on those. We also have protective security advisors that are part of uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency here at DHS-CISA, 
that can work to engage uh, on physical security assessments for a range of entities around the country. And finally, DHS has intel sharing capabilities for members of the faith-based sector. We have a platform here called HISN that appropriate members of the private sector can gain access to, to receive threat information. And Mitch's point about the Intel partnerships here is really critical from a physical security perspective. So I think as we think about a way ahead, we need to continue encourage, to encourage community members to think about this from a partnership perspective um, when it comes to prevention as well as physical security and information sharing. Thank you. Um, and just before I go to Dave, um, after that, we'll uh, read some questions from the audience. Just a reminder to the audience, some of you may have just tuned in more recently. Uh, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom panel um, where you can enter questions for the audience, which I'll be reading out. Uh, sorry, for the panel, which I'll be reading out uh, in just a moment. Uh, but Dave, yes, I mean, the, the Uh, and, um, you know, really that's, um, you know, the CST has, uh, is a very impressive, uh, important organization. And we'd be interested to hear a bit more about the work uh, you're doing on that. Sure. So CST is a, a, a charity, a nonprofit that works across the whole of the United Kingdom to protect the Jewish community from terrorism, anti-Semitism, hate crime, to support victims of anti-Semitic hate crime as well. Um, and we, we were formed in 1994, but we build on a much older tradition in the Jewish community in the UK of organizing self-defense against anti-Semitism, which if you go way back was about really confronting fascist movements very much on the streets. And then really from the 1970s onwards, as you started to get a proliferation of terrorism, primarily from the Middle East in Europe, it became much more about protecting Jewish buildings and other installations from terrorist attack. Um, we have around 95 members of staff in three different offices around the UK. We have around 2000 trained security volunteers who protect Jewish community events. Uh, we, we work very closely with government and police in doing all of this. And the British government provides around 14 million pounds a year to pay for commercial security guards at Jewish schools and synagogues and other buildings. And we administer that fund on behalf of the government uh, for those schools to then go out and hire their guards. Um, and a huge part of this of this work, as well as all the physical security um, and making sure buildings are properly protected. So we we uh, we will part fund security equipment at Jewish buildings normally in a, in a kind of match funding arrangement, and that will be gates, fences, alarms, cameras, and so on. Um, and we have a 24-7 a CCTV control centre that these fees, these camera fees from hundreds of Jewish buildings across the UK can feed into so we can react in real time and get those fees to the police and so on. Now, we're dealing with a much smaller community, of course. There's only around 300,000 Jewish people in the UK, Geographically, it's much smaller again, but we have a lot of buildings. We have around 600 different buildings around the country to protect. And one thing we've learned over the years is that the, 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 the Jewish building that gets attacked may not be the one that we as a community think is our most important. So no one would have predicted that out of all the synagogues in Germany, it would be the one in Halle that would get attacked. Similarly, the, you know, the most recent um, kind of successful attack on a, on a synagogue in this country was an arson attack on a synagogue in Exeter, which is a tiny, tiny community in the you know, furthest southwestern corner of the UK that no one would imagine that would be the one. And the reason it was that one is because that was the town where the person who wanted to burn down a synagogue happened to live. And so we have to be able to protect across areas where there perhaps is not so much of a large active Jewish community, but the, but the targets are there for people who might want to attack them. Um, and in that respect, the, the, the research, and this, this, this is similar to, to what Mitch was talking about, the, the research that can be done on who might be planning to attack the Jewish community and where they are and how they might do it 
is almost now that's the first line of security now and this the, the old distinction between research and security is no longer really apparent because that is almost the, the, the more effective way to prevent attacks before people even leave their homes and so we have a team of, of open source researchers who are very skilled at digging around in really horrible corners of the internet and finding these kind of people and of course the the the, the pools we're looking in are the same pools that everyone is looking in. So we've had two or three cases now where we've we've come across uh, extremists based in the United States who appear to be planning or moving towards carrying out a violent attack on the on the Jewish community or expressing a desire to do so. And we've passed those details on to American counterparts, and those have then fed into U.S. law enforcement. And the same has happened in the other direction as well. So I think there's some learning here that just as we're confronting really kind of global extremist threat, I think there's lots of ways in which we can work together in the sharing of information and supporting each other uh, as communities uh, in helping to protect each other, basically. Yes, I think the point you make about, you know, especially today, um, you know, terrorism, uh, while we expect it, um, it doesn't necessarily usually happen when or where you expect it. And I suppose that that's the point. And as you say, you know, that it's 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 not the uh, the most influential or the biggest synagogues necessarily though the ones that uh, need only need protection um, or other you know types of targets. Um, so a few questions here from the audience. Uh, David asks, um, uh, what claim do the latest wave of anti-Semites use as their respective sources as a reason to be anti-Semitic? -anti um, so are there you know we talked about the protocols. Um, uh, are there, you know, have you come across kind of specific and maybe more recent uh, sources of anti-Semitic ideology or conspiracy theory that are particularly influential today? And, uh, and if anyone wants to have a first crack at that. Uh, Mitch, if you want to go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, look, I think in the last week or two, you know, we're hearing you know, from 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 Kanye, from Kyrie, from from Dave Chappelle, you know some of the old tropes about you know the Jews' relationship with power. Whether it's you know a question of how is it that Kanye lost all of these sponsorships once he was he displayed his anti-Semitism, almost his proof that the Jews control the world was that in fact he lost. The Adidas contract and some of the other contracts, um, and you know it sort of becomes, uh, you know, in some ways almost a self fulfilling prophecy because you know action is called for in response to some of this, but then it provides um, you know a validation, and then you see people saying, "quote unquote," Kanye is right, and you know one of the most interesting phenomena that that we've seen, and, and Sam touched upon it earlier, is a little bit of the cross fertilization among different groups, right? So you've got, you know, Kanye, Kyrie, sort of black Israelite type of anti-Semitism. And then you've got groups like the Goyim Defense League, right? It's almost a laughable name, but they've modeled themselves on, you know, on the Anti-Defamation League in the sense of their, their nomenclature, but they're essentially neo-Nazi white supremacists. They're showing up in Los Angeles and hanging a banner over the freeway saying, quote unquote, Kanye was right. They're showing up at a Veterans Day parade in New York City and saying Kanye is right. So you've got, wait, white supremacists citing those, you know, black, um, you know, individuals who are on the Hebrew Israelite, you know, sort of a track. So the fact that they would cite another group um, view on, on Jews just shows that in some ways, the only thing they have in common is their anti-Semitism, but interesting to see this cross-fertilization. And by the way, we saw it a little bit in May of 21, when white supremacists were congratulating Hamas online. White supremacists don't think much about Muslims, yet here they were congratulating Hamas online for whatever Hamas was doing during that conflict. Thanks, Mitch. I don't know if uh, Samantha or Dave wanted to uh, touch on this issue of kind of sources of anti-Semitism today? Sure, I'll, I'll make just some general comments, which are, you know, the sources of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic fueled violence, the conspiracy theories are nothing new. <laughs> so um, whether it's accelerationism or the great replacement theory or Jews controlling the world, 
we've literally seen these for hundreds of years. And so, you know, Alexander, in terms of what's motivating anti-Semitic fueled violence today, it is not, from my perspective, at least materially different from what has motivated this kind of violence in the past. As I said at the outset, the words of leaders matter. The words of individuals with influence matter. And as we see individuals with large platforms use tropes, use these conspiracy theories, et cetera, that resonates. Um, it becomes normalized and we do, we do see a reaction. In addition, you know, we continue to see manifestos written by previous subjects and suspects cited as or integrated into content that more recent subjects and suspects are using. So um, none of these individuals are really motivated by anything wholly new. They're fragments of things and melanges of things that have been motivating anti-Semitic violence in the past. As Mitch mentioned, we do have this added layer now of individuals with influence making statements that are that are resonating. And again, as I said in my opening comments, we know that this kind of rhetoric has a nexus to violence. Yes, thank you. Of course, yes. Um, uh, in a way, uh, I wonder if maybe we're, is there examples of, of these old ideas being repackaged in some way? Uh, I don't know if you had final thought on that, Dave. You're just uh, you're just on mute. Go ahead. Sorry. And uh, look, in some ways, the kind of old packaging, if you like, of the protocols, the Elves of Zion, it has become um, not irrelevant, but you don't find many people directly quoting it or, or hosting it and so on. But the same ideas repeat and repeat. And the Goyim Defence League is an organisation we're increasingly seeing in the UK or online. And they're very, very good at packaging up those ideas in really eye-catching, bite-sized, kind of memeified content. But then there's also um, you know, there's a, there's a film that circulates a lot in, in anti-Semitic networks called Europa, The Last Battle, which is a 12 hour uh, documentary, right? 12, 12 uh, episodes, each an hour long. And it goes into immense depth about why Hitler was the greatest savior that was ever kind of promised to the world. And, and, and everything he said about the Jews was correct and so on and so on. You can imagine the whole content. Now, this is a 12 hour documentary and people are watching it and people are posting. It's very easy to find on Facebook and on Twitter and people are posting their comments about how it's completely changed their whole view of the world. So there is still an appetite out there for really in-depth, lengthy and very persuasive and impactful extremist content. Um, and the thing that is is that drives this uh, and that helps to spread these ideas is, of course, the algorithms of social media platforms. I mean, I've got a 16 year old son who spends his whole time scrolling through TikTok looking for videos about about football, about soccer. And one day, a couple of weeks ago, he starts getting videos of screenshots, screen, uh, you know, slideshows of going defense league memes about how Jews control the media. And he's never gone looking for this. He's not searched for anything relating to it. It's the TikTok algorithm has pushed it into his feed for him. And this, you know, we, there were quite a few videos like this that we had to deal with. So, it, 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 you know, that's how this stuff circulates. And it's always, it's new packaging, but it's the same old ideas. Yes, and I think, you know, we, even going back to um, some older cases, we see how uh, YouTube algorithms acted very similarly when, when there was more extremist content on there. Not that there isn't any now, far less, but yes, people watching relatively innocent videos, getting recommended videos of, of much more extreme stuff. Um, unfortunately, that's still happening. So we've had a few questions flood in, unfortunately, um, quite late. So I can't, I'm can't. i sorry to those who can't uh, address that. Uh, David Chanzer actually asks about explaining how we draw the line between criticism of Israeli policy and anti-Semitism. Just so you know, we, that has been covered. Uh, this event is recorded and available. will be available on our YouTube page. I'll just ask one last real quick question because it relates as well to what Dave was saying. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll direct this to Samantha first. Is, uh, from Robert, what do you expect the impact of closing these online settings for the exchange of anti-Semitic ideas, plans, et cetera, would be? Does pushing this ideology underground risk the creation of more crystallized and hard to detect networks? So 
what might be the impact of, of getting rid of these uh, uh, platforms, at least as, as sources of anti-Semitic uh, or anti-Semitic, sorry, ideas. Um, you know, are there sort of unintended consequences of, of that? Thank you. And, um, you know, D DHS does not close platforms. I, so I'll respond to the question uh, in the event that these platforms were shut down for some other reason. We are certainly aware that individuals are already starting to move to uh, more encrypted platforms, for example, to have conversations about um, related to acts of potential acts of targeted violence and terrorism and to speak with individuals uh, with like-minded ideas and perhaps plans. So as open source platforms perhaps could come under more scrutiny and or uh, become less accessible for a variety of reasons, we would anticipate seeing individuals continue to flock to darker places and more encrypted platforms, which is why this is not just a question of um, addressing a platform or a particular distribution network. This is really about, in the first instance, preventing this ki these kinds of um, violent ideas uh, and actions from starting in the first place. That's a prevention piece and getting engaged at the earliest stage possible. The, the platforms are not you know, the sole responsible factor for why an individual radicalizes or mobilizes to violence. We have to, we have to get closer to the source and engage earlier. Thanks, Samantha. And, you know, there's much more to cover. Unfortunately, that, that is it. A couple of questions related to kind of how can we get involved? How can individual help? Um, I would direct you to the websites of the CSI or the CST uh, on that, um, perhaps even, even the DHS. Um, thanks again uh, to Samantha Weinergrad of the DHS, Dave Rich of the Community Security Trust, and uh, Mitch Silver of the Community Security, Community Security Initiative. Um, if you want to follow more of the program's work, our uh, website is extremism.gwu.edu and on Twitter at GWUPOE. Thanks again, uh, panelists and, and uh, the audience uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.